There are also a number of chapters uh, around philosophy because both uh, both Sinead, who we've mentioned, but also one of the other editors, Yossi, are in fact philosophers. Uh, and I think that's very interesting. In fact, in, in a previous CG podcast, which my colleagues at King's, uh, Kate Chin Gainty and Daniel Hadass recorded, one of the things that was discussed, which was really interesting, was there's this idea that people in the, science, in the humanities and social sciences shouldn't trespass into pure science. You know, we've got nothing to say there. But yet, in fact, the re- obverse happened. You know, people in, in the, for, who were the science taking scientific decisions were actually making decisions which, of course, were, had enormous value judgments and ethical elements built into them. And, and I think that's, you know, so that's a really important aspect. So what do the chapters on philosophy, do you think, bring to the perspective of, of, of the book? Loads, and I think this is a really one of the again one of the really sort of um, contributions of this of this project is that it is uh, creating a dialogue between social scientists and, and humanists. Uh, you know, I mean, these two categories often often get lumped together, but, yeah. I, but 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 there is a distinction, and yeah. um, you know, and I think uh, within the social sciences sciences, you know, you, you've got sociology, you've got economics, you know, you've got heavily sort of positivist quantitative mm-hmm. approaches. Uh, that don't often engage, uh, you know, with the philosophical debates uh, around the concepts that they, that they use in their in their own work. So what we're trying to do with with this book is, um, again, you know, to, to to really highlight that that nexus, that that juncture, you know, between humanities and social sciences, and that you know, even as social sciences, let alone you know, natural scientists, use these concepts all the time yes. that are actually very very complex. You know, uh, you know, what is health? What does health really mean? That's a great chapter. Right? I mean, is, is, so that, you know, we have a chapter on health, you know, is is health a private or a public phenomenon? Mm. Uh, You know, what does that mean? You know, what are the implications of thinking of of health as as private as opposed to public? You know, is public health an oxymoron, right? That entire, that entire expression that gets thrown around so, so much. Um, And the concept of intergenerational justice, which is another one, you know, another chapter absolutely. and, and a lot of these, and a lot of these um, are also uh, linking to the debate, you know, of the distinction between life and bare life. Yes. Uh, I think that underpins a lot of these philosophy chapters. You know, what is the, what, you know, what, what is the point of being alive uh, if, if you know, you're only alive, only, only to be alive and for no yes. other purpose, right? And of course, that brings, you know, there is a chapter in the book on, on the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who is probably the most mm-hmm. famous uh, he, per, person in the, in the field of philosophy who took a very critical stance on the pandemic and has had the most flack shown at, thrown at them for that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, perhaps it's worth just talking through a little bit about that chapter as well and, and, Gamb- and Gambon's r- role in the pandemic. I mean, I suppose, do you think the fact that he did take a critical stance so early, already in February 2020, and, and, rece- and was on the receiving end of so much uh, aggressive hostility was, one, was an influential factor in in the broader silence around these themes in the disciplines for so long? Well, it certainly has inspired, you know, uh, a number of the authors in, in, in this book, you know, I mean, he, mm. he gets cited repeatedly, you know, um, throughout throughout the book, not just by the people who wrote in the philosophy section, but, you know, across across the book, really. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think it, it, you know, it helped give the, the debate and the response a kind of a unifying, unifying frame. Yeah. So I think, you know, to the extent that uh, on, on the side of lockdown proponents, You've got the science. Yeah. Maybe our sort of best equivalent as the, as the people who are trying to engage in a, in a not necessarily being anti-lockdown, but but you know engaging in a debate yeah. uh, about about it and, and sort of analyzing it critically. I think our response to the science maybe is this distinction of life versus bare life, right? That yeah. we, we were given this device, you know, yeah. this this way of of thinking um, about about this issue, which I think is is very helpful, and it is like the science, you know, it is something that uh, you can quite easily explain, uh, you know, to people who are not philosophers, who are not well versed in, in mm. academia. Uh, and I think it is important to have such framing devices, uh, yeah. especially when it comes to, you know, an issue of public importance like, like the one that the book deals with.